morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you, and today we're going to be um, learning a little more about St. Andre, the set of Montreal. There are uh, prayer cards here, and beginning halfway down, um, there's a prayer that we can open with, if you can still see. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together, St. Andre, your devotion to St. Joseph is an inspiration to us. You gave your life selflessly to bring that message of his life to others. Pray that we may learn from St. Joseph and from you what it is like to care for Jesus and to do his work for the world. St. Andre, we turn to you now and for our well-being. Never abandon those who turn to you in prayer. Whatever the pain and suffering going by now, give it attentions. Jesus, please hear my prayers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We can say this morning we're going to be um, talking about St. Andre, who was considered um, God's doorkeeper. For those of you who may not be acquainted with him, um, he's recently been made a saint, and again, a um, very important one for the Canadian people. Um, also, we'll see why um, he's called God's doorkeeper. But for that, some of you may have gone to the Oratory of St. Joseph. Anyone out there? Well, let's see, who hasn't got? <laughs> okay, that's better. <laughs> so anyway, we uh, see the, the saint is very much associated with that oratory. Um, he was born Alfred, Alfred Bassett, and again, he's known as St. Andre of Montreal, and he became uh, a brother of the Holy Cross Order Congregation, and again, as we said, he's a significant um, Canadian, Roman Catholic, French Canadian. Um, he was born one of 12 children. Um, and again, he was very, very frail all his life in his health. Um, he had been baptized in an emergency situation. And again, um, conditionally the next day. His father um, was a carpenter, much like St. Joseph. And he had to move his family um, to Quebec and uh, to become a lumberjack where the jobs were more um, easily to find. And also, we have to remember the great poverty that there is in, in Canada. Unfortunately, his dad died tragically um, when a tree fell on him. And um, his mother became a widow at the age of 40 Needless to say, with 12 kids, um, that was not going to be able to stay together as a family. And again, uh, she had to give up her children for adoption, but she kept one of them, Andre, who was so frail. And again, she kept him by her side while the other children went to an orphanage. Unfortunately, she was to die three years later herself of tuberculosis. So by the age of 12, Andre was a complete orphan with no parents at all. The training that he did receive from his parents while they were living, neither say he was very young, but at the same time they proved to be the road to sanctity for him. Um, like I said, he was so, um, he suffered from gastritis, some type, type of um, intestinal disease, and again, it inflicted him all through his life, and yet he lived to the age of 91. One of the other things that comes along with being an orphan and also being part of poverty is that he was illiterate. He was unable to read, and again, because of his ill health, he was unable to participate in sports, <laughs> with other children, and then later on in his life he was unable to hold jobs for any length of time. Whether he was in a factory, he um, would 
get some kind of um, illness because of being enclosed. And then um, other things that he had uh, going against him was he, he was a very clumsy guy. That, that's what it comes down to. He tried to get a job as a cobbler and with the hammer and all, he would always um, make a habit of um, stabbing his own finger. So that job didn't um, stay um, with him very long either. But one of the lasting impressions he had um, before his mother died was his mother's final words. And as the children were gathered around her, she said to them, my dear little ones, it has been six years since your papa left us to go to heaven. The good God is coming to look for me in my turn. Pray for me and do not forget your father and from the height of heaven I will watch over you. Needless to say, being illiterate, he was unable to read and again um, his success at doing strenuous farm work or any kind of job was limited. But his um, religious upbringing in such a family, again, um, planted the seeds. Again, he was able to do Stations of the Cross. He spent hours and hours before the Blessed Sacrament in the church. And again, later on, this would prove um, beneficial to him because this would become his lifelong job. He also spent time cleaning the church whenever he could. So again, his attraction to the Lord and the Blessed Sacrament, uh, uh, again, foundational. He ran into a priest named Father Parvinkel. And again, it was this priest under whose wing he finally um, drew close to. And Father Parvinkel saw his sanctity. And he began to teach him how to read. And he instructed him in the sacraments, especially the Holy Eucharist. And again, as he improved his reading skills, he began to memorize the four passions of the Bible. He's known to be able to recite word for word, the four different gospel accounts of the passion of Jesus Christ. And then, again, he also inflicted severe penances on himself whenever he sinned. Even though he was ill in health, uh, he would inflict um, some kind of a penance. And people would say, you know, because of your health, you shouldn't do this. And he would obey. He would obey them. But then he would find another kind of penance to do. So he was just determined, just determined to... Um, work on the road to holiness. <clears throat> One of the beautiful things um, that our faith tells us is um, that we're always on a journey. And again, where we go and who we meet make all the difference in the world. Andre actually came to the United States for a while at the age of 18. Again, looking for employment. He spent some time in Connecticut. And again, he... Um, <laughs> He had a vision during this time. He had a vision of, um, he just seemed to see a large stone edifice um, with a high cross um, on top. And again, um, when he returned to Canada some time later, he became, um, he saw that it was at the College of Notre Dame that he was going to um, start attending and also become the porter, which is the doorman very insignificant, poor, literate guy. Again, he wasn't very ambitious. But it was at this position of being at the door of the church or at the door of the college that he was going to be so influential to people who came uh, through the door. So again, he was um, a failure, a failure by worldly standards. And um, this edifice that he had saw in his dream, I guess had been misinterpreted. Some had thought that it was the hospital in which he died, but actually it was the College of Notre Dame that he died spiritually. This vision that he had was the time in which he gave his life for Christ and took the simple vows of being a brother in the congregation of the Holy Cross. So again, in a sense, he did die at the age, um, a young age, and again, as he joined the religious order. Congregation of the Holy Cross, again, has been named the official congregation of the church by Pope Pius IX in 1857. They had a rocky start in France. There was persecution by the Masons and all sorts of factions over there. 
And again, uh, even St. John Vianney recognized this special skill. He said, this congregation of the Holy Cross is destined, after many trials, to perform great works. And soon a small contingent of those Holy Cross, two priests, some nuns, went to Canada to begin the work of spreading the faith in that area. As um, he took the black habit, needless to say, he was not too popular. But then, well, anybody who was poor, anyone who was illiterate, uh, useless in the sense, um, people in congregations have to earn their living for the most part, and earn the money for the congregation in order to have their health insurance and all the benefits that they have. So again, they didn't see what Andre had to offer. But he did take his simple vows, and again, he was not always accepted or well-liked, but that did not deter him. This is a special quality of somebody who's been called by God. Somebody who knows in their heart that they've been called, um, does not let anything of the world deter them, not even criticism or um, just people standing in their way for their vocation. And he, again, continued to be a porter for this religious order, and again, I had a strong devotion um, as well to St. Joseph. And then the miracles began. His first assignment as the porter for the College of Notre Dame, he was to hold this position for 40 years. Can you imagine? <laughs> Such a simple job for so long, no promotion. No sense of gratitude, no sense of self-esteem or climbing the ladder. This was this simple priest, or brother rather. And often the object of scorn and ridicule, he became what was called the lightning rod of the college. His superiors always used to dump on him. And again, um, that did not deter him. He became um, great friends with many of the students in the college and often prayed for their well-being. It was this, too, that he was sought out for prayer. And again, when people had needs, um, he had, very soon, the reputation of being a miracle worker. This only distanced him, once again, from his community and the skeptics in society. The brothers and the priests in the order were jealous. One day he was scrubbing the floor. There's a, um, as you know, there's always legends associated with the saints. One day he was um, scrubbing the floor, very simply, very humbly, and praying at the time. And two men brought a woman to him who was on crutches and unable to walk. He didn't even look up. He just kept scrubbing the floor. And all he said to the men were, let her walk. And she dropped the crutches, and out she walked. And he continued scrubbing, but he kept the crutches for the church. And that was just one of the first sets of crutches that would do in the uh, church, as we know. And the miracles continued, and the crowds gathered. We remained simple, and it was a tribute. He attributed everything to the intercession of St. Joseph. When they claimed it was his power, when the people started coming, again, the humility of this man um, showed. He was very, very angry. And he threw out people who would actually um, say that he had the power instead of St. Joseph. And he called them the devil. He would be very angry and call it out loud and clear. After a number of the miracles um, that he was known to, um, that were attributed to his presence. Uh, one of them was also, um, after befriending a lot of college students, he was a porter at the um, infirmary, and he used to go to visit the students when they were sick. And he was going down the hallway looking at each of the men, and then he stopped at one of them. And he said to, you, to him, you're not sick. You're slacking. Get back to class. So not only was he able to see where healing was needed, but he also saw those who were taking advantage and again, another skill he had. The Bishop of Manchester, I mean, um, the Bishop of Montreal soon asked to investigate uh, all these stories that were coming uh, about um, Andre. And his superior reported to the Bishop. 
And the bishop um, asked the superior what he thought. And finally he asked the superior a question. If Andre were told to desist from all his works, would he do so? Now imagine the popularity is coming at him. Everyone's clamoring to see him. Would he desist if he were told to do so? Superior said he would obey blindly. The bishop said, then leave him alone. If it comes from God, it will continue. If not, it will crumble away. Though not the first to conceive of a church on the hill and dedicated to St. Joseph, Brother Andre again began starting his mission to build some kind of um, place where St. Joseph would be honored. He started to collect money. How did he do so? By becoming a barber. He used to befriend the students, talk to them about spiritual direction while he was cutting their hair. And then if they offered anything, the money went right to the building of the church. He asked permission to purchase the land. And one day, one of his friends noticed that a statue of St. Joseph in his room had actually turned around. And he questioned Andre about it. And Andre just simply laughed and said, St. Joseph did turn around, but he's looking in the direction where he wants his church built. And sure enough, on Mount Royal, that's where the building began. Mount Royal. We know the Oratory of St. Joseph, as it stands today, um, became a huge, huge structure that could contain even St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Uh, he began this project. Again, more miracles abounded, crutches, hearing aids, all sorts of devices um, began to um, be a part of the church as well as a sign of the healing powers that were going on then. Again, Andre pointed to St. Joseph. But again, his reputation spread to Protestants, Jews, Muslims, and even agnostics. And always showing his devotion to Mary as well. His rosary was always visible. The rest is history and is the future, the miracles as well. They continue historically for us to be a part of. On his deathbed, his prayers were offered for the defeat of communism. The following year, the Holy Father published a encyclical called Divini Redemptoris, condemning communism in honor of Andre and the, his special prayers and special um, service that he had to the church. And he released this encyclical on the feast of St. Joseph in honor of the simple doorkeeper. Andre died with prayer in his lips. His final agony said, like our blessed Lord on the Holy Cross, his faithful imitator had spoken these words in holy resignation to God. My God, how I suffer. Heaven is wonderful and beautiful. That is worth all the trouble which, which one prepares for it. How good God is. How beautiful. How powerful. Mary, sweet mother, mother of my sweet Savior. Be merciful to me and help me. Saint Joseph. His final words, Saint Joseph last intelligible word on his lips. St. Andre Bessette, pray for us. Those of you who are going to be remaining, maybe we should look at some of the spiritual things that go on here with this simple man and how God does pick the simple.
lead in special ways, especially in the areas of the soul. They don't seem to be uh, very intelligent. They don't seem to be um, volunteering for the job. Um, we wonder why God picks the disadvantaged especially um, to lead his mission. So again, you might have had that experience yourself. You might know somebody in your own family who um, just becomes an inspiration to everyone, even though they're the least likely we would think or the world would pick to be their saint. And also, um, let's reflect this morning on the role of St. Joseph. Again, um, the role he plays in our life and in vocations, but also, what was his role in the family? How did he take care of Mary? How did he take care of Jesus? How did he face danger? How did he lead them? Just a simple carpenter, again, called by God to take care of, of Jesus and Mary. So again, these two things we might be able to reflect on in our discussion for those who remain. And again, I hope that you'll have a pleasant day. God bless you. Thank you.